Indianapolis, a city destined for greatness. Indianapolis's growth has always been tied to an understanding of its location. In the geographical center of a state known as the Crossroads of America, much of the nation's people and commerce regularly move through Indiana. Hoosiers have always understood the importance of transportation, understanding the crucial role it plays in the city's economic growth. The same is true today. As a leading transportation hub to the nation, Indianapolis must continue to capitalize on its location by planning for the future. Up-to-date transportation infrastructure is crucial to its economy and jobs. For that reason, in 1975, the Indianapolis Airport Authority began envisioning the future needs of air transport for the city. The existing facilities, first opened in 1957, had been expanded and renovated many times, but studies showed they could no longer adapt to future needs. With tremendous foresight, the Authority's 1975 master plan made provisions for growth into the 21st century. The plan featured two larger parallel runways, direct highway access to Interstate 70 to connect planes, travelers, and cargo, and a modern midfield terminal complex to handle more planes, air travelers, and security issues. The Airport Authority's goal to usher Indianapolis into the 21st century as a world leader in air transportation. Encompassing high glass walls, framing a view of aircraft coming and going, and set against a background of downtown Indianapolis, the complex makes a dramatic statement of Indianapolis's place in the future. The heart of the building is a civic plaza, a central gathering point whose circular shape recalls the shape of the city's well-known monument circle. Thirty years in the planning and with numerous revisions in the process, the design provides for modern functions such as security and concessions, as well as public event space. With its striking design, the impression of visitors should be a vibrant, progressive, growing city in which to visit and do business. It will serve as a destination and a gateway as well as a powerful symbol of a thriving city. But most importantly, it will open the door for continued economic growth and employment to this great city and state. Already the vision has begun to be fulfilled. Landside development, including roadway access, utilities distribution, parking and support facilities are under construction. Estimated to be completed in 2008, the one-mile by two-mile project site will cost about one billion dollars to complete. Welcome to the new Indianapolis Airport Project. I'm Jay McQueen, Deputy Project Director. We're proud that industry transportation leaders, including 14 major airlines, have chosen Indianapolis as a major transportation center for their growing businesses. In fact, last year, this airport served more than 8 million passengers. The new glass-enclosed passenger terminal building will feature more than a million square feet of space. This facility will usher Indianapolis into the 21st century as a world leader in air transportation ensuring new jobs and more business for our people. Contemplating a project of this magnitude, the geographical size, the number of people, the equipment, the supplies required might seem overwhelming, but with the dedication and hard work of thousands of people like you, we will accomplish the job.
Hello, I'm Mike Martin, OSIP Safety Manager for the new Indianapolis Airport Project. For the sake of those working to make this possible, the Indianapolis Airport Authority has made a commitment to create a safe place to work, one you can be proud of to come to each day. To do that, we must comply with numerous federal, state, and city authorities. For instance, our safety program will meet and exceed IOSHA standards. The Indianapolis Airport Authority recognizes valid cards from many different organizations to keep you and your fellow craftsmen safe on the job. These will be used to maintain a safe drug and alcohol free project. To do so, all workers will be tested pre-employment, annually, if suspected of being under the influence of intoxicating substances, post-accident or incident, and randomly while working on the project. Periodic audits will also be performed to verify compliance. You should also know that you will be working in a very unique environment. Working near federally regulated airspace requires compliance with other rules and regulators, both federal and state, that you may not have worked with before. You will hear of new agencies and terms such as the FAA or Federal Aviation Administration, the IAA or Indianapolis Airport Authority, which is the governing body of the airport, OSIP or Owner Controlled Insurance Program, which mandates many safety regulations, terms like AOAs or Airport Operating Areas, which are highly secure areas at the airport, and FOD for Foreign Object Debris. To maintain compliance of these laws, the IAA or Indianapolis Airport Authority has established procedures for working in the AOAs or airport operating areas. AOAs are potentially dangerous areas of the airport intended for aircraft landing, taking off, maneuvering, and servicing airplanes. These areas must not be distracting or confusing to pilots. They are also considered areas of high security. Therefore, any work performed in the AOA requires permission from the IAA authorities as well as permit badging or a security escort. Another regulation is that you are not to drive any vehicles in the AOA without prior consent from the construction manager, the OSIP safety manager, and most importantly, the Indianapolis Airport Authority. If you understand the potential dangers and reasons for these rules, you'll catch on quickly. Professionalism is reflected in how we do our work, and the Indianapolis Airport Authority is a very professional organization. The IAA expects all workers to act accordingly. That is why offensive language and graphics will not be allowed anywhere on the project. Professionalism is also the key to a safe work environment. To accomplish this, the IAA has required that we implement a safety program or concise set of rules that everyone is expected to abide by. The safety program requires each contractor to complete a safe to work plan for his or her scope of work before work begins. This plan, commonly called a job hazard analysis, will describe the safety hazards associated with each task to be completed and will ensure that all hazards have been properly addressed prior to starting work. The safe to work plan will be good for one week but must be updated and communicated to the craftspeople when work activities change. To ensure that, each and every day, contractors will be required to discuss with each of their craftspeople the hazards that will be encountered. In addition, the first work day of each week, toolbox safety meetings will be required of contractors with their workers. These informal meetings will provide safety education, answer questions, and notify you of potential hazards and upcoming activities. Safety training for specific tasks is required by Indiana OSHA other regulatory agencies or the contract specifications are the responsibility of your employer. You should never attempt to perform a task without proper training and knowing the associated hazards and risks. Periodically during the project, safe work behavior will be promoted and rewarded with a safety recognition program. All contractors and craftspeople will be eligible to receive safety recognition awards based on exemplary safe work habits milestone safety achievements, and for work above and beyond the project safety practices. On the flip side, you should know that violations of the safety program or federal, state, and local laws will result in disciplinary action to the contractor and or employee involved. There are two types of violations that may initiate the disciplinary policy, flagrant and minor. 
Flagrant violations are defined as those that may have potentially severe consequences or place individuals in imminent danger. Anyone found committing a flagrant violation may be removed from the project immediately. Minor violations are defined as infractions of safety practices but with a lesser degree of intent and resulting danger. A progressive disciplinary policy will be used for minor or non-serious safety violations. For the first offense, you will be given a documented verbal warning. For the second offense, you will be issued a written warning. After a third offense, you will be suspended from the project for a period up to one week. And finally, upon a fourth offense, you will be prohibited from working on the new Indianapolis Airport project. Remember, your company may also have a disciplinary policy, and in all cases, the more stringent policy will take effect. The new Indianapolis Airport Safety Program has very specific requirements for reporting incidents, accidents, and injuries. All accidents, regardless of severity, must be immediately reported to your supervisor. Contractor management must then notify the OSIP safety manager and project management of the incident. If the injury is not life-threatening, you must report to the nurse practitioner in the on-site project safety trailer. The nurse will evaluate, administer treatment, or determine whether additional treatment is required. For after-hour injuries and those requiring further treatment, you will need to be transported to Methodist Occupational Health Clinic at 5603 West Raymond Street. Injured employees must not transport themselves. Only a supervisor is authorized to transport injured employees for off-site medical treatment. If it is a serious injury, immediately call 911 and tell the operator that you are located at the midfield construction site and the gate number. I believe there's a broken bone, a lot of blood. Uh, we need to meet at the eastern rally point. Remember to consider all blood and body fluids as infectious. Only personnel who are properly trained and equipped to deal with bloodborne pathogens are permitted to do so. If you accidentally come into contact with body fluids, wash your hands and all exposed surfaces of your body then immediately contact a member of the OSIP safety staff. It could be a fire, severe weather, or an airport emergency. Emergencies do arise during construction. Having a well thought out plan and being prepared will always be our best defense in these situations. Every area has an evacuation rally point and a severe weather rally point, but due to the size of the footprint, both the terminal and parking structure projects are required to have their own emergency action plan. Therefore, review the job site bulletin board for essential details such as signal methods, reporting protocol, emergency numbers, and evacuation routes. Also, be sure you talk to your supervisor or safety representative about the emergency action plan for your area. If you're like many workers, you're unaware of the Hazard Communication Standard, commonly referred to as the Right to Know Law, and how it protects you. Material Safety Data Sheets, or MSDS, list all the chemicals present in products, the hazards associated with using the product, and what safety measures you are required to take. Contact your supervisor for the location of your company's MSDS book, or ask any safety representative for assistance. Review your MSDS before using any product. Follow all the requirements for personal protective equipment or PPE. And if you do not have the PPE you need, stop and get your supervisor. You will encounter all kinds of hazards during construction of the new Indianapolis airport. Personal protective equipment or PPE will protect you from these hazards. Let's take a look at what PPE you will need and when they are required. Hard hats must be worn at all times, even while using a welding hood. Hard hats must be in good working order with no cracks or dents. Safety glasses must be worn at all times. Only clear glasses are allowed inside the buildings. Employees with prescription glasses are required to wear hard polycarbonate side shields. Gloves must be worn when handling any sharp objects while performing any material handling duties, when handling any chemicals, or when performing demolition work. 
Foot protection requires sturdy work boots. Safety-toed work boots that cover the ankle are strongly recommended. No tennis or athletic shoes are allowed. Face shields must fit over your hard hat, must be worn in addition to your safety glasses, and must be worn at all times while using the following tools. Chop saw, cut off saw, any type of abrasive wheel or compressed disc, grinders, powder actuated tools, jackhammers, chipping hammers, and during heavy demolition operations. Welding hoods must fit over your hard hat, must be worn during all welding operations, and should have a shade of 11 or 12. Employees must wear tinted face shields or goggles with a shade of 5 or 6 during all cutting torch operations. Hearing protection is required for all operations over 90 decibels. A good rule of thumb is if you have to raise your voice to speak to the person next to you, you're above 90 decibels. You need to be aware that numerous construction operations will require a permit or tag before work can begin. This will help you and your employer to conduct the required pre-task hazard analysis before doing the job. You may be required to use the following permits and tags confined space entry permit, excavation permit, critical lift permit, hot work permit, and a scaffold tag. Stop and contact your supervisor or safety representative before performing any permit required work activities. As we mentioned earlier, working near an airport requires special attention to safety details. And while we abide by all Indiana OSHA regulations, there are many cases that we exceed them. Simple housekeeping on the job site is a good example. Debris and other materials can have very destructive consequences for aircraft, as well as you. Housekeeping needs to be a priority for all phases of the project. Dust construction material and debris known as FOD for foreign object debris cannot be allowed to blow around the job site and potentially enter the airport operating areas. Contractors must aggressively manage their housekeeping programs to eliminate the possibilities of dust and debris from entering the AOA. In addition, all contractors must continually address conditions that may attract wildlife to the project site and surrounding areas. Examples are food waste and ponding of water. Remember, many lives are at stake every day here. Anything that affects the safety of airport operations needs to be addressed. The same goes for maintaining a clean work site. You will also be required to keep the following areas clean and free of obstructions at all times. Walkways, stairway landings, and emergency exits. To prevent trips and slips, rolling materials such as pipe, all thread, or conduit must be picked up immediately. Each day, construction workers are seriously injured, some fatally, due to falls. That is why fall protection violations will be considered serious, and as a result, you may be immediately removed from the project. While working on the new Indianapolis airport, craftspeople are required to utilize fall protection while working above six feet. This includes ironwork and roofing. Adequate fall protection may be accomplished by having a full body harness with a shock absorbing lanyard, anchor points that can withstand a 5,000 pound force. These anchor points do not include all thread, pipe, conduit, or ceiling grid. Retractable lanyards may also be used provided they do not create a greater hazard from their swing radius. Anchor points should be overhead as no fall should exceed six feet. Other ways to prevent falls above six feet are through the construction of safety barriers. Guardrails are an example. If using safety barriers, remember these rules. Guardrails must be constructed to withstand 200 pounds of force in any direction with less than three inches of deflection. Suitable materials are two by fours and wire rope. Guardrails must be constructed with a 42 inch top rail, a 21 inch mid rail, and a four inch tow board. Floor openings need to be protected by securing to the floor a suitable covering that can withstand two times the maximum working load. These covers should be marked hole or cover. When using articulating boom lifts, you are required to use a harness and shock absorbing lanyard at all times. When using a scissor or platform lift, your feet must be on the platform at all times. If this is not possible, or you must lean over the rail edge, 
Personal fall protection is again required. You are only allowed to tie off to scissor or platform lifts that have a manufacturer approved anchor point. All ladders must be designed for heavy duty use and the following precautions need to be taken to prevent falls. Each ladder shall be visually inspected before each use. Defective ladders must be tagged out of service and removed. When ascending or descending a ladder, you should face the ladder and use both hands, maintaining three points of contact at all times. A rope or bucket shall be used for hoisting tools and material if they interfere with maintaining the required three points of contact. Step ladders and extension ladders shall only be used by one person at a time. A step ladder should never be used as a straight ladder. Step ladders must be fully open and you may not use the top two steps. All straight and extension ladders shall extend three feet over the supporting object when used for access to an upper level, be secured from movement at the top, be equipped with non-skid feet, and be placed at an angle so the height to base ratio is four to one. And remember, employees working from a ladder with six feet or more fall exposure must use personal fall protection. Scaffolds are common on construction sites. They are used to get workers and material to greater heights. When using them, pay attention to these rules. All scaffolding must be erected and dismantled under the supervision of a competent person. All working levels should be fully planked. Your minimum working surface is no less than 18 inches. Fall protection is required on all levels above six feet. This is accomplished by having a 42 inch handrail, a 21 inch midrail, and four inch tow boards. If handrails are not possible, a personal fall arrest system should be used. Excavations can be extremely dangerous if not managed properly. That's because soil is so heavy. In fact, one cubic yard of soil weighs over a ton, so follow these rules when working around excavations. Employees entering excavations must be trained in excavation safety prior to entry. A competent person who will determine the soil classification must be present at all times. All excavations over five feet in depth must be sloped or shored. All excavations over four feet in depth require a ladder or ramp for entry. These ladders or ramps must be accessible within 25 feet of any work activities in the excavation. Your on-site supervisor will complete an excavation and trenching form daily as long as workers are entering the trench. Oftentimes, construction sites contain areas that are considered confined spaces. A confined space is defined as any area not intended for human occupancy, having limited egress or entry, and having the potential for a hazardous atmosphere. You may not enter a confined space until you have been trained in accordance with Indiana OSHA standards. Stop work immediately and notify your supervisor if you encounter a confined space on your job. Electrical connections, tools, and power cords are everywhere in construction and can be very dangerous. Properly working ground fault circuit interrupters prevent us from being shocked or electrocuted. That's why ground fault circuit interrupters are required at the power source anytime you use an extension cord. Fire prevention is a constant responsibility. It is of utmost importance on the construction site. Smoke from a fire could create visibility issues and cause major impacts to air traffic. Most construction fires are the result of activities such as cutting, grinding, or welding. You should know where the closest fire extinguisher is located at all times. Fire extinguishers shall be conspicuously located, accessible, inspected, and maintained. Early in the new Indianapolis Airport project, certain areas of the project may be designated open shop, meaning no hot work permits or fire watches will be required. However, most areas will require hot work permits. As construction continues, the use of hot work permits and fire watches will be required throughout the project. 
You will be notified in your safety meetings when this becomes necessary. For many of the same reasons, special care must be taken in storing flammable materials. Only approved containers may be used and they must be kept from heat and ignition sources. They must never be stored near exits or stairways, which would block emergency egress. Be sure all required signage and labels are placed on all flammable storage cabinets, tanks, and containers. Each contractor using hazardous materials shall follow spill prevention methods and provide and maintain appropriate spill containment equipment. If a chemical is spilled or released, contact the OSIP safety manager immediately and prevent any chemical from entering waterways, drains, or sewers. In addition to compliance with Indiana OSHA standards, the following project-specific requirements apply to compressed gas cylinders. Cylinders, including B-tanks of acetylene, must be stored in an upright position and be secured with suitable wire, chain, or bar, or in properly designed carts, racks, or holders. Valve protection caps shall be used when cylinders are stored or moved and at the end of each shift. Torch carts and gas cylinder racks may be lifted by aerial lifts only if they are designed for lifting. When not in use, separate oxygen and acetylene by 20 feet or a 5 foot high, half hour fire rated wall. When working on energized or moving equipment, a lockout tagout program needs to be implemented. You can get locks and tags from your supervisor. You will need to install the lock at the energy source to ensure it is safe to work on. The tag will show who locked out the piece of equipment and the duration it will be de-energized. If your work involves or affects other contractors or airport operations, you will need to coordinate with the construction manager to ensure the safety of everyone involved. Heavy equipment will be present on site in particular, large earth moving and aerial lifting equipment. The most important safety device on any piece of heavy equipment is the operator. You may be asked to operate this equipment, so remember these precautions. You must be trained, always wear your seat belt, always watch where you're going, and be aware of your surroundings. And if you don't have a clear line of sight, stop. This video has covered only the highlights of the Indianapolis Airport Authority and IOSHA safety program. It is your responsibility as a contractor and craftsperson to be aware of and follow all safety and security policies while on the project. If at any time you have a safety concern or question, please do not hesitate to contact your supervisor or the OSIP safety staff. We believe the new Indianapolis Airport project will offer rewarding jobs for everyone involved, but that can only happen if we all work together to make safety our number one priority.